I'll welcome everybody. Make sure, make sure you good. Good. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you, everybody, for letting me know you could hear me now. So I'm um, Dr. Carolina Pataki, the co-founder of Love Discovery Institute. I'm also a licensed and marriage and family therapist um, here in the state of Florida, and um, I work with individuals and with couples, helping them to nurture, heal, and grow in their lives and their relationships. And this really starts with our own emotional and cognitive wellness in ourselves, which is also has a lot to do with our ability to connect with um, our ability to, to connect in our relationships. So um, I also have an office here at the Carillon. Um, however, right now I'm only working through telehealth, teletherapy services for both individuals and couples. So before we begin, um, I wanted to thank the Carillon too for putting this together, providing us with this platform along with just their support. And um, I also want to I thank a lot of um, a lot of you for taking the courage today and just hopping on today. So a little bit about what I will be talking about today, since we need to learn how to navigate through our emotions during these times, is um, to start helping you understand what it is that we are currently experiencing and how this relates to your emotions. So you could start to identify your emotions and your triggers so you could better manage them. So to give you a few tools on here today, um, you could start learning how to manage through your emotional and your cognitive wellness uh, during these very odd times of uh, prolonged um, global uncertainty where none of us are immune to what's going on right now. Now, so you will find that um, our world as we knew it to be has in some ways collapsed very rapidly for us, which what happens uh, with that is that there is a sense of um, safety that we start losing. Uh, we, there's also a loss of, of, of structure and an overall normality in our lives that we've also kind of lost. Um, there's also a loss for some of the places that we used to go to, um, loss for our workspace that we're used to going into, loss of our routines, such as the ones that we used to visit at some point. And that may be like whether it was getting coffee at the coffee shop that we used to swing by on our way to work, or um, there are local favorite restaurants where we'd meet up for, with our friends or that we would end up going to some of our um, date nights with our partner, um, or the loss of maybe some of the places that we used to even go to, to release some stress or to feel better about ourselves, such as the gym. So there's a loss of certain activities um, that we used to enjoy, um, along with also the way that we would interact um, with, with our loved ones. So there's a lot lot of losses. For some individuals, there's also already been a loss of a loved one. Um, so what you'll find is there's, um, the, these are all parts of losses that we are collectively experiencing. This is what's called grieving. Because of, because of that, I thought it'd be a good idea to review some of the stages of grief um, to start out with. So we could start understanding some of what we might be experiencing and through the grieving stages, there's also underlying emotions that also surface with each one of these stages. So for example, um, to start understanding some of these stages of grief um, and, and what they look like, it was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who provided us with these stages. And with the stages of grief, we have a wave of underlying emotions that just surface. These stages show up in no particular order. So as I talk about the stages, know that you might have experienced one stage or another, and you may not experience all of them. So keep that in mind. So the stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, and acceptance. 
final stages are acceptance, which there's a lot of power in acceptance, but also there was another added stage, which was meaning, which I'll also talk a little bit more about. So with denial, for example, this, we tend to see this earlier on, but then again, you know, like I mentioned in no particular, er, um, in no particular order. So it may show up later. And so denial, what it looks like is when we're in this place where we tell ourselves, I will not be affected by this, for example. So um, these are the individuals that maybe continue to have the life that, continue to try to have the life that they used to have by continuing to be out and about um, as much as they can as they continue to lose some of the places that they used to go to, but maybe they're still trying to um, have parties or meeting up with friends or whatever that might be. So it's some of the denial and how it shows up. Another stage is anger. I'm angry that my regular activities are being taken away, um, taken away from me. So here in this anger, which anger could also, a lot of underlying emotions around anger, uh, such as loneliness, sadness, and so many other emotions. Um, here, um, you may be angry and you start out with blaming even. So often with anger, we see a lot of blame coming up for individuals where they may, may be blaming the, 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 the government for the way they ran things or um, blaming the Chinese and even calling it the Chinese flu because they're angry. And so there's um, understanding to giving yourself permission to feel the anger without necessarily reacting to it. So you can move through the stage of, of grief when it's the anger that you're connecting to. So another stage of grief is bargaining. And here we are stepping into negotiating and this negotiating really happens with, with ourselves. Um, this is where we start bargaining within our own system as we knew it within our own being. Um, so this might look like, okay, I will um, wear a mask and, and go out, but um, I won't get sick, right? Okay, so we start bargaining with ourselves with like what might feel safer or what uh, might feel more certain to us um, as we tr try to scramble around um, the idea that we're trying to find some sense of security or safety within our own being. Um, following, there's also the next stage, sadness. Um, with sadness, this is where we kind of drop in. There's this feeling of, you know what, I, I just feel really sad. Um, we might find ourselves saying things such as, you know what, I feel sad that um, I don't know if I'll be able to ever get back into my workspace because it just doesn't feel safe anymore. And I don't know if it ever will. Um, so there's a sensation of surrendering, of loss, of um, at this point, we start letting go of what we were still trying to hold on to when we were still bargaining and when we're still in the anger of it. Um, so there's also, you know, like I said, the last stage is acceptance. So in acceptance, we start dropping into, you know what, like, yeah, this is happening. This is happening and I must just figure out how to be able to continue moving forward from here on. And, um, and, and I need to move forward from the situation. So there, there's a lot of power in acceptance. We even find a sense of relief, a sense of, um, of, of relinquishing some sense of control. Um, here, it may look like, like how you start jumping into uh, new activities online that you have found and that you perhaps really enjoy. Um, or you might find yourself uh, saying, you know what, I'm working uh, from home virtually and I'm, I'm really starting to enjoy um, some of the time that I'm spending with my family or with my kids. And so here you're enjoying an aspect of the given situation. You're also growing from a given situation and you're learning and you're just 
pretty much in the space of allowing yourself to fully accept your situation from a place of nurture and growth. So finally, um, you know, last stage that was set later on, which again was meaning. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this um, in a few minutes. But to understand that these last two stages, we see much of the transformation that happens within ourselves here. There's much space for, for growth in these two stages. And through these different stages, we have various emotions that surface. So keep that in mind that you may experience and go through. Um, that you could almost like pull on. And so whenever you're pulling on one, you're also pulling on a different one because all the emotions are all interconnected. And so you're, you'll be touching on one emotion as you're touching on another. So learning how to connect to your emotions. So with um, additionally to the stages of grief, um, we've also been experiencing what's called anticipatory grief. Here there is a buildup of anticipation for something that we're feeling. Um, so when we're uncertain about what the future holds, we're, we're in this anticipation of what's coming. Like there's this idea of like there, there's something that's coming um, and it's this like it's this invisible virus. And so there's this threat. And so the uncertainty continues to, to build. This kind of grief can become very confusing to individuals. Um, and so um, this kind of grief, when it becomes confusing to individuals, it's part of our primitive mind that knows something bad is gonna happen, but you can't see what the extent of that will be. Um, and so it's incredibly scary. And um, this is, this, this becomes like a fracture in our sense of safety um, to the world as we knew it to be. So now we don't have that sense of safety that we used to feel, even though perhaps we were already in a world that wasn't that safe to begin with. Now that's been heightened, it's been highlighted. And so we're in that space with anticipatory grief. And this brings up stress, tension resulting from the demanding circumstances, anxiety and fear um, over the unknown. So anxiety can occur on its own um, as a response to stress, or it, it can be a trigger to stress. What matters is learning how to respond to the anxiety in a helpfully, helpfully way so that you don't get carried away by it, so you don't get swept into it. Um, so one of the tools, one of the tools that is incredibly powerful and creates a base to, um, a lot of these things that we've been experiencing, which is falls a lot under grief and some of the emotions that surface with grief, um, is, is one of the simplest tools when we are able to start recognizing the power of it. And that's the power of your breath. When you start connecting to your breathing, you start through the breathing, connecting to the rest of the of your emotions. So I, I want us to take a few moments right now. Just I want us to take a minute or two to just connect with our breathing. So if everybody, I welcome everybody to even, um, I invite all of you to even close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to just give yourself permission to connect to your breathing so we could explore how we are feeling. So I want you checking in. This is called learning how to check in with yourself. And this is something I want you trying two or three times a day, right? So learning how to check in with yourself by connecting with your breathing, okay? Um, I want all of you to kind of ask yourselves as you notice your breathing, 
noticing your body, noticing the sensations in your body. And I want you to just notice, as I've been talking about grieving so far, like, what are you noticing about how you're feeling, right? So taking a few breaths and just notice. Let's take a moment, tuning into your body. Again, notice how you're feeling. Become aware of your emotions. And identify in the here and now and just allowing without judging, without judging the feeling. I want you to just name the feeling, saying okay to it. And whatever it is that you found, whether it's worried, anxious, stressed, overwhelmed, angry, helpless, sad, uncertain, whatever it is, giving it permission to be there. Because to create a base, we have to first, the first thing to note is that it's completely normal to be experiencing a wide range of emotions. And this will start helping you in a few ways. So um, please open your eyes now if you um, did close them. Um, so, so this will start helping you in a few ways. Uh, first, settling the unsettling and, um, and creating a foundation and a structure to the uncertainty. Two would be accepting your feelings and naming them is often a way to feel immediately calmer. And also an important first step to healthy adaptability is also accepting what you're feeling. So, um, so you have to first make that time for yourself. And I, and I would encourage you to take some time each day to start recognizing what it is that you're feeling and also accepting it. Okay, so there's, um, there's three reasons why we, we usually do not know how to feel um, along with, um, there's three reasons why we don't usually allow ourselves to feel our emotions um, or when we don't have, um, you know, and, and when we don't, we usually go into this like inner conflict with between what we feel and what we think. So there's this like incongruency. And so we need to learn how to align our mind and our emotions. And it starts first with the core of feeling those emotions. And so the reasons that we usually don't know how is one, meta emotions. And meta emotions are emotions about an emotion. And so this is where, um, for example, I might say, I'm feeling really sad right now. And so I notice myself feeling really sad, but all of a sudden I'm feeling guilty that I feel sad. That's the meta emotion. And so I'm feeling guilty because I, I, I just heard perhaps my neighbor say he lost his job and I still have a job. So now I don't allow myself to feel my sadness. So through meta emotions and understanding them, we understand that we have to allow ourselves to feel our sadness so we can move through our emotions and surrender to them. And that's when we start healing and moving through healthier stages of grief. Um, secondly, um, we haven't been taught by society that all our feelings are okay. There's still a lot of judgment um, and stigma even around some feelings, um, whether it's, um, to give you an example, if, um, if, if you grew up in a household where uh, maybe you were taught that um, you had to man up, you know, like as a little boy, you were told, Oh, you know, don't be a crybaby or something. And so you learned that being sad or being frustrated wasn't allowed in your household. And so there's still a lot of emotions that are not acceptable. So starting to learn that all emotions are okay and they're needed so we could move through them. So finally, we're also afraid of some of our emotions, which we carry judgment on. And so we feel that if, if we let ourselves feel something that we're judging or that's uncomfortable, then we're going to go down this like slippery slope because we haven't been taught that it's okay to feel all 
and any of your emotions. And so the slippery slope might look like, well, if I allow myself to feel sad, no, I can't let myself feel sad because then I'm just going to end up super depressed and I'll never get out of that one. When it's actually the other way around, we end up depressed when we've been repressing our emotions and not moving through them. So um, besides accepting our emotions, to better care for ourselves and manage our like our overall well-being, we also need to understand how the mind creates triggers. And so here, the emotions are here. The breathing allows us to connect here. Um, here, we, we go into the trigger space where we have to start understanding what these triggers might look like. And I'm going to talk about th three of them today. So um, three of the triggers to look out for. Um, one is called hypothetical worry. With hypothetical worries, we include these what ifs. This is when our mind goes into the what if thoughts um, and are typically around things that don't have much control over. So this may look like beaming into the future with what ifs. Uh, you go into the supermarket and you're like, what if someone gets too close to me at the supermarket and I catch it? Okay, and it's not to say that it may not be real, but if you're sitting in your apartment and you're going into these what ifs, then now you're creating scenarios that are creating and building more anxiety and more of a narrative in your mind into the things that you can't control. So um, another trigger is generalizing. This is when your mind starts to generalize and goes into these all or nothings, everyone, never, forever situations. Okay, so for example, I'm gonna be stuck. I'm I'm gonna be stuck inside here forever. Life is never gonna go back to the normal. Okay, so catching these, catching these generalizations that we make that overblow um, some of the situation at hand, and it just creates more anxiety for us. Um, third, um, threat scanning. So with threat scanning, this is when your mind literally searches the environment um, for what you fear. And this happens consciously and subconsciously. So with threat scanning, um, it's often associated with your mind assigning meaning to harmless events. So this, an example of this may be um, free frequently checking your body for coronavirus symptoms. Uh, perhaps maybe you went to the supermarket and you're back and now you're already feeling your throat hurting or a tightening in the, in the chest. You know, so again, like it's threat scanning where um, it could also look like obsessive, uh, obsessively checking the news for the coronavirus updates. You know, so slowing yourself down. When you bring yourself back, when you notice and catch these um, triggers, um, two ways to work with them is on one hand, you could write them out. As you write them out, you're already slowing down the brain. The second part is connecting with your breathing to surrendering and allowing yourself to feel perhaps the fear, the sadness or whatever else you may find there. So when, when you see the mind is going into these triggers, pause, stop and connect with your breath or write it out. So um, to continue to learn tools to navigating, like I mentioned, um, you know, breathing, um, that connects you to your emotions, um, allowing them, naming them, and accepting them so you can move through them. Um, also, we talked about understanding your triggers so you could stop giving them power over you. Okay, you want to focus on what you could control, not on what you can't control. So you could even make a list. Um, I would encourage you to make a list on what you could control. I can control my routine, my relaxation times, cultivating and deepening connections, eating healthier, exercising, uh, my news intake, things that I can control. Okay, so things outside of my control. Well, um, other people's decisions, um, other people's um, health, um, what the government chooses and how the government decides to address this, uh, flights being canceled. These are things we can't control. Okay. 
other ways to continue to navigate through these times, humor, okay? It's important to have some humor. Um, there's a lot of heaviness that is out of our control. Um, so we must also create some lightness in our life in some ways. And so creating humor through, you know, sometimes I look outside, you know, from my balcony space and I see the way that individuals are walking around and, and I try to look at the humor part of it by seeing some of the funny walking aspects to it. Um, so, you know, watching also funny movies, like trying to find some of the humor within the midst of the darkness. Um, other than humor, I wanna go back to the, the meaning, which was the, the last stage that I talked about. Um, with meaning, there's a couple of ways to connect to meaning um, and, and get through into these stages. Um, and one of them is through reframing. Language is incredibly powerful. And so reframing by using words such as some of my favorite reframes lately have been instead of lock up or quarantining, um, cocooning and nesting. You know, and so what you notice when you start reframing is that you start being able to adapt to something different. Because with lockup, I feel hostage. Um, with cocooning and nesting, I start feeling like, wow, what can I create for myself within my home and with my partner? So um, another reframe um, that I love is deepening connections versus social distancing. So what you notice with reframing is that we, instead of giving up our power, we step into our power of the things we could control. And when we do that, we start being able to create something for ourselves in the midst of something that's incredibly horrific to all of us that we're all going through. Um, another part of meaning is um, an or another way to connect to meaning is historical continuity. And this is when we start exploring some of our stories that we've grown up around, um, stories of, uh, of courage and adversity. Um, so in talking to your parents or your grandparents, reaching out to them and, and hearing their stories, and this allows you to also deepen uh, your connections. Um, so to continue to navigate through the emotions, you could also create, um, I'd recommend also creating an action plan for yourself, for your partner, for your family, um, create a schedule uh, that maybe changes every few days or every week, um, maintaining a regular sleep schedule, um, also starting a daily gratitude practice, creating certain affirmations that you could repeat to yourself daily. Um, when, when we start creating gratitude practices, we're able to start seeing what we do have in our lives. Um, when we start creating affirmations, we start creating intention, intentional living in, in our lives. Um, also connect to your senses. So nurture your senses. What are you seeing? right? Um, what could you allow yourself to see that nurtures your senses? Tasting, um, you know, what are you tasting? What are you allowing yourself to eat? Is it healthy? Um, smelling, using some essential oils around the house that allow you to connect to maybe certain smells that bring you a certain sense of calmness in your life. Touch, touch is essential. Okay, so even if maybe you have the coronavirus, okay, and like making sure that you hug yourself and like feel that touch and hold yourself while you're connecting to your breathing. Um, so finally, what you are listening to, right? So you want to make sure that you're feeding and nurturing what you're listening to. And with that, I want to invite you to listen to a poem that I found that I'd like to share with all of you today. And again, if you're tuning into listening, you might want to connect to, to again, um, as I invite you to close your eyes, if you will, while I read this poem. 
So you could really tune into just listening to it and connecting to your breathing as you listen. So this is a poem by Joyce Barlett. It is called A Blessing for Staying Inside. May you find happiness in the small spaces, joy in the staying put, no, no highways, no office buildings, no crowded subways. May you find peace in your own kitchen. May your four walls feel like a sanctuary, a heaven from a noisy world. May you take pleasure in a bad pun, a bowl of popcorn, laughing with the people closest to you, patting the grateful dog, the clever cat. May you discover the delight of writing letters on paper and baking cookies and the birds visiting your early spring garden. May you find yourself fully in the present moment where all of life is happening right now and worries about the future don't exist. May you invent ways to help people who need you because times like these were made to remind us that we are all the same. And so if, if anybody's closed their eyes, you could reopen them. Um, so with this poem, um, something it got me thinking about uh, that I like shared with my partner was about building rituals. Um, when, when I first just read this poem, I was like, how do we start creating some rituals which help us slow down, basically. Rituals help us slow down to find happiness in, in the smallest of things. It helps us find meanings in the smallest of things. It also creates a familiar structure. Um, and this way, it allows you to start building those connections. So I do encourage all of you to find some rituals. Um, I know from you know reading the poem, uh, one of the rituals that my partner and I have been doing we were quick to identify the baking cookies. So we've been baking cookies once a week right now, and that has enhanced all our senses. So, um, so I encourage all of you to build rituals for, for yourself as an individual, for yourself as a couple, for yourself in your family unit. Um, and also um, I encourage all of you to be kind to yourselves uh, be mindful of your emotions, of your inner critic, and remind yourself that you are doing your best. Once again, I want to thank all of you for being a part of this. Uh, um, you know, I'm sorry we got started late. Thank you for being patient with me on technology. Um, I also want to thank, um, you know, again, the Carillon. Um, I, I, I want you to take a moment um, to just thank yourselves for, for feeding your souls with, with healthier information today. And please feel free to follow me on Instagram um, or any of my social media platforms. Um, visit my website, lovediscovery.org. You could sign up to the newsletters for, uh, for some of the tips and exercises that will allow you to continue to nurture, heal, and grow. And at this moment, I don't know if we have a few minutes at all. Um, checking on the time, I think. Um, but if anybody wants to send any questions or anything, um, we're going to have other conversations and um, other discussions coming on. So um, if you send any questions or anything that you may want to hear about, uh, the next one, we, we could perhaps tailor it towards that. So um, again, I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, I'm sorry, do you want to help me? And, and my partner Max is trying to help me here with <laughs> something, if you could all bear with me. Um, I'm not really sure, but... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, so we couldn't figure it out. There was a slide that we we're going to show all of you.
But I want to thank all of you for, for being here today. And, and um, I hope to see you again in the next uh, conversation that we're having.